Hello, my name is Jessica. I am the creator of Once Upon a Pesto. Thank you so much for joining us today, this live Q&A with a couple of cooks, and that is Sarah and Andrew. So this is something new. Um, today we're gonna be combining culture. So what is it like when two people who are passionate about food come together and bring their cultural heritage into their cooking. So Sarah is, uh, her heritage is Chinese, Andrew Italian, and so today we're gonna be talking about intercultural food and recipes. Uh, Sarah and Andrew are on the West Coast, so in California near San Francisco, and they will be joining us here shortly. I encourage you to comment, add questions during this video. If you're watching it later, same thing. Put your comments uh, below the video and tag both me and a couple of cooks and we would be happy to answer any questions and, and chat through um, what we're gonna be talking about today. So I hope everyone is excited as Sarah and Andrew will be joining us very shortly. Welcome to everyone who is tuning in right now to this video. It's a live Q&A uh, conversation with Sarah and Andrew. Their Instagram handle is at a couple of cooks and they are gonna be talking today about their heritage and how that comes together in cooking. They're both very passionate about cooking and Sarah is uh, originally, uh, heritage is Chinese and Andrew Italian. And so what do you get when those two come together in the kitchen? Uh, Sarah, you know, she brings expertise in making sushi. Uh, she is also very talented in other uh, traditionally Chinese recipes and then Andrew, of course, the classic Italian foods, you know, pasta, pasta sauce, pizza, things like that. So they will be joining us here shortly. I'm going to invite them up onto this screen here and we will get started talking about intercultural food and recipes today. Thank you to everyone joining us. I encourage you to ask questions, comment, and we'd be happy to continue this conversation with you both uh, during and after this video. So I uh, just invited Sarah and Andrew onto the screen and they will be able to, you'll be able to see them below here shortly. Hello, how are you today? Good morning. <laughs> Hello, so nice to meet you both. Sarah and Andrew, how, how, uh, how's your weekend going so far? How's our weekend going? It was good. It just started, really. So yeah. we, we went to bed at about 3 a.m. last night because yeah. we were playing hockey till about 2. Wow. Well, <laughs> one of us was. Yeah. <laughs> then one of us went on to skate afterward. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining uh, me today, talking about intercultural food and recipes. I am so excited. This is something I've never done before, you know, combining two different heritage conversations into one. So uh, we have a lot of people tuning in here. So excited, uh, Sarah and Andrew, to do this with you. Um, let's start right away. You know, um, let's start how you guys met and, and kind of what that, um, you know, discovering your, your shared passions for food was like. And then we'll discuss, you know, Sarah, the Chinese side, and then uh, Andrew, the Italian side. So tell us, tell us that story. How did you guys meet? Do you want to attack this one? No, you got it. All right. So how does somebody from San Francisco meet someone from Ohio? Well, we met online. <laughs> so uh, we met on a dating app called Coffee Meets Bagel. Uh, both he and I were single, um, going on various dates with people, and we were just finding the partner that we were looking for. And suddenly I matched with Andrew. He starts talking about hummus and how he likes to cook. So we decided to go on a date. Uh, we actually went to a restaurant named Hummus. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> and he was eating a bunch of hummus, and I thought that he was more interested in the food than he was in me. Mm. But it wasn't until the 
third date when he invited me over to make gnocchi at his place that I realized, you know, we have a lot of good chemistry together. We work well in the kitchen and I think we can make a good team. So we decided to take it more seriously. Yeah. And that was about four years ago. Wow. Awesome. She, needed, she just needed some convincing sometimes, you know, didn't, didn't, didn't believe everything that I was telling her. At first. Oh, Jackie's there. <laughs> Those don't be she, enjoy. She's like, he's too nice. There's no way he cooks and has his own place. This isn't dating like, you know, four other girls at once or something. So she had to get me interviewed by her friends too and stuff. You know, I had to go through that whole thing. Wow. Oh, yeah. Then when, yeah. Andrew, did you make the journey from Ohio to California? Um, why? So why? Well, I'll start with when it was like six years ago. And why is um, I was working in banking and I wanted to make a career change. And I just um, started applying to different places, including uh, video game companies, because I liked gaming and thought that was an industry I wanted to break into. So um, I got a call from EA just like randomly and the process went really fast and uh, got the job. And basically in two weeks, I had, had to quit my banking job and uh, told my friends, hey, I'm moving across the country and family. And we, I literally packed all my stuff in a U-Haul, put my car in a trailer behind it and drove across the country and then started work two days later. So, <laughs> yeah. Wow. And, and Sarah, you know, how was that... Um you are from San Francisco. So, yeah. you know, tell us a little bit about that culture and kind of what it's, it's allowed the two of you to do in terms of food and, you know, pursuing your culinary passions. Sure. So growing up in San Francisco, I, I just know that I am in a big melting pot. I was exposed to various cultures, ethnicities and foods at a very young age. And um, when I met Andrew, I thought it was a great opportunity to introduce him to a bunch of things because, uh, for example, one of our dates, I said, let's go get some omakase. And he did not know what omakase was. <laughs> I said, do you know what sushi is? And he says, yeah, like California rolls. And I said, oh, no, I have to introduce you to some raw fish. Um, so that's an example of how Growing up in San Francisco has impacted my relationship with Andrew. Um, and also because I was very used to my mom's cooking and my grandma's cooking growing up, I've never experienced cooking foods on my own. So when I met him and learned that he likes to experience in the kitchen, I thought, well, we can start taking on different ethnic cuisines that I never had a chance to uh, cook and he never even had a chance to taste. So... I thought <laughs> um, that's why we also started a couple of cooks because it was an ex exper experiment that went really well. And we like gathering feedback from other people who um, specialize in that cuisine. They give us tips and we're just learning from people every day. So great. Is it like Instagram, social media? It really is. It's a whole new world as cheesy as that sounds, but you guys are experiencing it you know your your feed is fantastic i love seeing all the different cuisines that come through in it um yeah and any, anyone joining in who isn't already following you i encourage you to follow a couple of cooks um Thank you. so let's let's go into and, and you guys can rock paper scissors who wants to go first um but let's talk more about you know growing up and and what those experiences your exposure to your heritage was like well, yeah, you were talking yours. You can you can just continue because you were talking about your mom and grandma and the stuff like that and your family. So you should talk about that. OK, so although I'm ethnically Chinese, my parents are from Southeast Asia and different countries. So my dad grew up in Cambodia and my mom grew up in Burma. So that influenced a lot of what they're used to eating and what they introduced to the kids. Um, growing up, my grandma always made Burmese cuisine. And um, my dad was really good at just blending things. <laughs> so he would mix Thai cuisine with Vietnamese cuisine. Um, so that's, that's my exposure on an early age. But then when we were kids, we really liked um, immersing into the American culture. And when we would learn that our friends would go to places like Olive Garden, Chevy's, and um, 
what was another big one? TGI Fridays, which no longer exists anymore. Yeah, they would... I forgot about that. <laughs> I remember that place too. I used to like their potato skins though. Oh, that's the best thing. It's, yeah. it's the loaded thing to do on Fridays. Um, I would beg my parents to take us to these places just so we could try it. And that was my exposure to American food. <laughs> Good. And you? Uh, me? Did you grow up eating lasagna? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that is what my friends made fun of me for, because like they they always knew like if I didn't want to go and have dinner with them or something like that, and my my mom was making lasagna or something, because my dad would make the sauce and my mom was just really good at you know properly layering everything like that. So uh, it was always a team effort um, back in in our house. Um, we hardly ever ate out. I would say that my family ate out maybe once or twice every couple months. Like it was pretty much just cook at home all the time. Uh, which is where I kind of wanted to do. Uh, we um, oftentimes as well, and I, I don't know if this is true out in San Francisco or not, but um, we always like gathered as a family uh, for dinner. It was always like the, like no matter what everybody was doing, we'd always find our way back to like the dinner table. And that's where everybody would kind of um, have that like communal thing. I think it's a, a bit more um, of Italian. I, honestly, I, I, I think um, that's what my grandparents did. Um, and it was always like, you know, like manja, come eat manja. Um, so it's, you know, it's always, that, that's always where we found our way to, um, in terms of what we ate, it was, it was a mix. Um, it wasn't, I will say like for sure, my experience before I came out here in terms of having like, uh, Eastern Asian food, Your um, palate. Indian food. Yeah. My palate wasn't as expanded in those areas. We, we ate a lot of Eastern European style food. So Polish, Latvian, Lithuanian, um italian of course uh lebanese things things in that area uh just in like kind of uh, eastern european was really where my family cooked a lot of and um i i also then i want to say too beyond even family and growing up in college um i had a group of friends who were also um just randomly passionate about cooking and um, when we all got like places and stuff like in your junior and senior year um we decided that we were going to do like a wednesday dinner night and everybody had to the group would vote on the thing to cook and it was if it was your turn you had to try to cook it at the place that we were going like so we'd, we'd cook it at somebody's house and it was always great because we'd pick like different ethnic stuff everybody was kind of from a different background and that gave me a lot of experimentation like juices i guess you can say of like oh, I, I i like trying to cook different things like sometimes it would be great sometimes it would be maybe we'll get pizza but yeah <laughs> you know so you it, it, yeah at least you try so yeah that's that's where like um i, I would say like i got a, a lot of more of my passion for cooking i i always had appreciated it because my family did it so often um and i would try to help out around the kitchen uh, with my dad or my mom whoever was cooking that day um but then yeah in college it was really really where i discovered like hey i can do this too awesome and um so then when you guys met and this this experimentation, like you were saying, Andrew, continued, um, do you remember the first, you know, dish that, that was brand new to you, what it was um, for each of you and, and how you decided to make that dish? Oh, man, we've done so many. Do you remember the first one that was brand new? Like, I think Gnocchi for her was brand new. She had never made it. And that was an Italian one. But that wasn't new for me. Um, yeah. You know, what's what's brand new and what we actually specialize in now is oh, yeah. um, when he went home t for Christmas and told his family, hey, I'm dating someone in San Francisco. She's Chinese. They all of a sudden just um, said, Chinese? Okay, that means Asian. We're going to have to get you a wok. We're yeah. going to have to get you a sushi kit. We're yeah. going to have to get you a rice cooker. So he came home with all these Asian appliances <laughs> and he's like, Sarah, let's get to work. Um, so in 2018 was when we started making sushi together and I'll tell you at the beginning, we didn't know what we were doing and yeah. we wasted a lot of ingredients, but, um, with time and with practice and with connecting with people who would give us tips on like, no, you should be rolling it like this. You should put less meat. Uh, we actually, I think, I don't know, <laughs> would it be too much to say that we're really good at it? 
We're you are. She's better than me. It looks great. I mean, it's got a, some like it's like a panda bear shape. It's it's, uh, it's all it, like pretty much all her. I I do like I could do the rice. I can do like you know some of the behind the scenes stuff. I'm okay at rolling. I I I special. I like to say I specialize in other things. Most of the feed like you'll find me cooking something, but sushi is like pretty much seventy five percent her. She. <laughs> Somehow just has like the patience and the eye for it. And I, I maybe I'm a little too like, I just kind of just go, you know what I mean? And I'm in the kitchen, I just kind of like just do. Whereas like sushi kind of like, she's like, you need a certain amount of rice and it's spread like just so. And you need a certain amount of meat inside or else it's going to be too big. And me, when I'm cooking, I'm just like, yeah, I'll do this and this. Oh, it doesn't taste good. All right, I'll add a little bit of this. Like, it's like. You know, you know. what the difference is, Jessica? I noticed that between Andrew and me, he's really good at cooking like on the stove and I'm really good at assembling when it comes to salad, uh, yeah. you know, wrapping a burrito, toss, yeah. you know, tossing something together. Presenting anything, things on plates. Yeah. Anything that's away from the heat probably is my specialty and anything that requires heat, making sure it's cooked, uh, making sure there's enough flavor and spices yeah, and seasoning. Yeah. That's Andrew. Yeah. That's this is so neat. The chemistry there, you know, we talked about that very early on. Um, but so, so sushi to me is fascinating. And Sarah, with, with your practice and Andrew, you're kind of like admiring all of this coming together. It's an artwork. And yeah. how, how do you go about, you know, these ingredients into that finished, beautiful plate? You know, kind of take us through real quickly what, what sushi is all about. Um, I've never made it myself, but you have kind of sparked that interest in me. <laughs> You know, something interesting we learned is that sushi chefs, when they decide to take on the journey to become a chef, they spend almost five years just learning how to make rice. Wow. And um, that, that to us is the hardest part, too. And I think sushi is all about the rice because not only do you have to have a quality fish, but if your rice is too sour or too sweet or too soft, even the texture um, it just will change your entire meal. And that's why even to this, the, the roll yeah, yeah. And I think even to this day, we don't feel very comfortable cooking the sushi rice yet. We just buy it from a grocery market that we trust. Yeah. Uh, I practice sometimes, but yeah, to her point, like I'll get it a couple times. And then one time I won't get it quite right. And then like she said, it just doesn't, the roll just won't be there no matter what you do to it. And you can't, like I, like I always say, like I, I, I can usually fix something in the kitchen. It doesn't taste, she'll say this doesn't taste good or something like that. Like if we got something from a restaurant even, and I'll be like, don't worry, we'll fix it at home. And the, and I can go and like fix it and kind of put some different sauces and spices in it and it'd be fine. Sushi rice. Yeah. If you, you got one it, shot, if you yeah. mess it up, you know, you might as well just throw everything away. Yeah. So yeah, the element is definitely rice. And then there's a piece of nori, so seaweed. And now they have other types of seaweeds um, where they are made of this like soy ingredient for people who are allergic to, to kelp or seaweed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, after that, it's your fillings. So people always struggle and I struggled hard uh, with rolling because if your filling is too hefty, um, then your sushi is going to explode. It's like a Guilty. burrito. <laughs> yeah. I'm so, always like, my eyes are big. And I'm always like, no, oh, eat more. This is too tiny. And then I'll put it in there. It's She's like, you're not going to be able to roll it. It's not going to work. You know, like, oh. Yeah. After I do it and I see it like, spilling out the sides, I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. I always like to put a uh, tasty protein in there. So if I'm making like a California based roll, then I'll have imitation crab. Sometimes I'll even use real crab and then um, tempura, shrimp, various vegetables like cucumbers, avocados, sometimes even carrots. Um, and then the top is what I love to play with the most. So you can top it off with avocado slices, different colored sushi, fish like hamachi which is yellowtail salmon which is an orange color and then red tuna so when you have all those three colors blending together with the avocado it just creates this rainbow and that's one of the rolls i like to make the most the rainbow roll and then after that you could top it off with some flying fish row which is called tapiko there's also sesame seeds green onions you can sprinkle some you know, where do, unagi sauce, where do you get your, mayo. Where do you get your ideas for those, like, bears and everything else? Oh, the, the bears. I even just got a 
Hello Kitty yeah. sushi mold. Uh, this weekend that I'm really excited about. I get those ideas from people who design different bento boxes for their kids. <laughs> Brian's like, rainbow roll. Yes. <laughs> That's fascinating, Sarah. So, so neat. Um, it's such a, a skill, you know, it's so neat that Andrew, your family kind of set you guys up with this. Um, and it's just led to so much more. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was my sister, um, my parents got me the walk. And then my sister got me the sushi set with like a little book and stuff. Because um, mm -hmm. she's like, you guys would enjoy doing this together because she knew we like to like cook and stuff. So yeah, it was it was them two that did it for us. Awesome. And um, would you say lasagna is lasagna versus gnocchi? What you no. mentioned both of these as the no. my, my, my lasagna is pretty killer. Uh, I usually will make um, and that's like, that's not to brag, but like, I, I'll do like um, a homemade sauce. I usually will cook the sauce for at least like five to eight hours. I'll start it early in the morning. Um, like a ragu, uh, and I'll mix in there some like different meats uh, to give it some flavor, slow cook the meat first, start adding in the sauce, um, season it up, kind of let it keep keep simmering and then add in some more things throughout the day. Um, and then by the time it's ready, uh, I won't use any like, you know, those people will use like these, oh, they're ready to bake noodles and all this rest of this stuff. Like, no, I, I got to do the whole process of like making sure everything's, you know, floured properly oil the water, cook it so they're nice and slick and smooth. Um, I make sure everything's tucked down on the sides. You got all the layers proper. Um, I use the ricotta cheese and I mix it um, together with a, a few different things as well to add some extra flavor in there. Um, so yeah, th it's definitely like lasagna and her family. I don't like, we, I made it for Thanksgiving one year cause they asked for it again. Like they tried it once. And they, I'm like, I, I can make like turkey or something like that. Like, would they want that? She's like, no, my family wants you to make lasagna. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I was like, all right. Well, then it must be pretty good if that's what they're requesting on like a holiday. It's very good. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. So that that's probably my like Italian dish specialty. Okay. And or just that that sauce that he makes, that yeah, bolognese she likes sauce. The sauce um, yeah. I like just using that for pasta later on if there's leftover. It's because it, he takes almost eight hours. Yeah, I started to pretty cook early. It. Yeah, yeah, and because I know that he puts so much time into it, I know it's good stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, what is it like then? Um, you you mentioned San Francisco as this melting pot. You know, to get these ingredients, the the quality that you're looking for, the variety. Um, what is that experience like, you know, shopping in San Francisco that, you know, is unique to the area? I think it's very easy to find ingredients because we have the general stores like Safeway, Costco, Whole Foods. But then we also have the specialty international grocery stores like Draeger's, um, like the place where I get my sushi ingredients. There's a ton of Asian markets like 99 Ranch, H Mart, Cook J Supermarket, Nagia. Yeah. Um, because we have so much, um, I, I, I guess, like, what would you say? In, in, in various pockets of the Bay Area. So, yeah. like, if whether you lived in the San Francisco area or across the Bay Bridge to what we call the East Bay, um, South Bay, which is where San Jose is, or even to the coast side where Pacifica is, and there's like a ton of clam chowder and fish over there. Um, you'll always be able to find the ingredients or be able to drive about 30 minutes out and be able to find it. So everything is within distance of where you live, just because the Bay Area is so vast. Um, there's tons of people here driving up the markets. <laughs> um, and yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, and then there's, of course, like you have, um, you know, weather, when the weather's nicer and stuff and it's in season, you'll have the farmer's markets and everything. Mm -hmm. like that. Like those. Um, and we even have like uh, in Redwood City where we're near, um, they do, uh, well, they used to like with COVID, things are a little different, you know, obviously. So, but they used to do these um, events where they had like, like remember the salsa festival the one time oh, yeah. and like, oh, wow. they used to be like just different things. And like, we'd go and grab stuff from those. We Oftentimes the, the events that we go to together are like food related events. To, to, to be honest, that's like usually where we connect. Um, like right, like Foodie Land is one. That's all pre cooked stuff, like the food, the food trucks. But like yes. I'm just giving examples of things. Like that's pretty much what we do. So like, like you're saying, like finding the ingredients. 
Uh, that's no problem. It's mostly just finding like the inspiration to try new things um, is what we end up doing more of nowadays. And that's where even her Instagram feed has evolved into a little bit of us even eating out and trying new places mm-hmm. too, just to get an inspiration. Because oftentimes when we go out, we'll look at the menu or we'll get something. And we'll be like, well, we could replicate this at home. And then we go and try to um, try to do that. So uh, that's where, because, you know, when you've been dating and cooking for, you know, several years, you want to keep the, what it, keep it fresh, right? Keep your menu fresh because uh-huh. otherwise, like we have a few staples that we eat pretty consistently. Yeah. But like we try to not, like we, we keep like even, <laughs> she started keeping like a diary of what we eat in a month just to like be like, we shouldn't repeat things all the time. She doesn't like, just like we don't like repeating vacation destinations. That's like her yeah. big thing. She's like, I don't want to keep repeating the same foods all the time. Whereas for me, like, Low key, I always sneak pasta in every week, every every single week. There's always yeah. pasta, but I like what he mentioned about um, these food fairs because um, back to the question that you were asking, a lot of local businesses and small businesses get a lot of exposure because they are allowed to come out as vendors to show off what they cook or what ingredients they provide or even what you know types of services or um, things that they do. So it these food fairs in the Bay Area really allow vendors to shine and to have um, a space, a spotlight for themselves. Even if they don't have a physical building or address, they they are well known because of their name, their brand, and then they use social media to promote themselves as well. And also word of mouth. Yeah. Yeah. So we never have a problem trying to get the ingredients that we need. No, that's for sure. Or the people. <laughs> <laughs> So let's let's go to that idea that you were talking about eating out and then getting that inspiration and recreating it. What's been, you know, kind of one that stands out in your memory as a recreation that you've done? Which ones? We've tried um, Chicken 65 recently. Oh, yeah. Chicken 65. We which... purposefully went out and bought like uh, like seasoning and stuff to try to make it. Cause it's one of her favorite, um, like Indian appetizers that we had tried. I don't think you had tried it before me. Right. No. I had known that one. Yeah. So that was one I got lucky. Um, and one of my coworkers, um, who was Indian and, um, uh, he, he was still passionate about making like Indian food. I've, I've actually, so it's, it's funny. I have to say like, Oh, he still wanted to make food. Like the other thing about the Bay area, a lot of people love to just eat out. Like that's pretty much the common thing to do yeah. here. It's just, it's an eat out culture. And I found like versus Ohio, like nobody cooks around here or uses their kitchen. A lot of times I think it's probably because of the lack of space, because there's a lot of places that just don't have the room to, to cook. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he, he um, brought in Chicken 65 homemade one time and I had tried it and she had happened to be there because it was like a little like work gathering for like um, uh, your, your like family and stuff. So mm-hmm. I brought her um and that was one that we just started both liking uh just like the flavor and the way like it hits your tongue i don't know so like we went out to um this indian restaurant that we really like up in um milbray Milbray. yeah milbray it's called sugan sugan yeah okay and they're uh, actually nepalese yeah sorry nepalese yeah Mm -hmm. um and they they made it there too and we're like we just kept thinking like, man, one of these days we're going to make this. And like just a couple of days ago, like like a week ago, we decided to finally like do it. So we were slowly gathering all the ingredients and made it ourselves. Um, and I think that was one that stood out to me is like the in the past years, like we've done other small ones, but really trying to tackle ones that require. I always thought like Indian food, especially or, or Nepalese food or anything like that requires a lot amount of spice and practice and everything. And I was like, Okay, it wasn't perfect, I'm going to be honest, but like it came out pretty good. It was a little on the spicy side. I tend to like spicy food, even if it doesn't always agree with me. And she was like, you're cutting too many chilies, you're adding too much spice. And I'm like, no, 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 this is going to be great. And the taste was was pretty much there, but um, the texture wasn't quite there yet. I think I could have um, uh, fried it in the oil a little bit longer, make the chicken crispier, and then the spice was a little too hot. So um, we, need, we needed a little bit of stuff to cut it back. But yeah, but yeah I, I think that was one that stood out to me, even like a recent thing that we like, we're, we're really trying to keep expanding to things that we didn't think we'd ever try to make. Like I was like, I always told her, I'm like, yeah, that's probably too hard. We'll never make that one. So. Thai cuisine is another one that we perfected. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like curries, Thai, especially yeah. Thai curry. Um, we've definitely done a good job there. In fact, oftentimes I'll look to her and be like, 
I'm craving curry this week. So you know what that means? And she's got to go out to like 99 Ranch, like special special stores and like go pick up the stuff we specifically need. Like you said, like we have specific stores where we get specific things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, then she'll be like, she, she's in charge. Of, we, that's another part we split. I'm in charge of a few different stores and she's in charge of a few different stores. Oh, that's so, so cool. <laughs> yeah. We so- usually share and split everything pretty much down the middle, including responsibilities in the kitchen. Like if I cook and stuff, she generally helps with prep and cleanup um vice versa sometimes you know it's like where one person does everything but then we just know that like the other person will help out in other areas we, we pretty much split responsibilities down the middle like with everything including like the shopping and stuff yeah way to go you guys are awesome <laughs> what about <laughs> splitting it when it comes to you know say the week ahead how do you determine what the dishes are going to be for dinner. Oh, you know, is it I'll, tell you, I'll tell you that. I'll look, this, I'll look at Sarah and I'll be like, what do you want to eat this week? It's, it's always her. I'm not like picky at all when it comes to stuff. And if it were up to me, I, I just make like a lot of the things I'm most comfortable with all the time. But she, um, she generally like getting, I call it moods where like, she's like craving something and like wants that like hardcore I don't usually ever get like that. Like once in a blue moon, I'll be like, I'm really craving something. But like, yeah, for her, it's like, so like, oh, I've been really craving like, you know, random thing yeah. X. And like, we'll make it a couple times. We'll have a couple different dishes of it. So I, to be honest, if, you, if you're asking planning, I'll generally look to her. And what she'll do is she'll be like, and I'll give you a pasta day or a pizza day. <laughs> oh, okay. And I'm usually okay with that. Like, honestly, like I, 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 it doesn't really bother me. And, um, and then lately with, it's been even a little bit harder because um, I'm coaching uh, youth hockey now and playing it and then also doing softball, which I'm like helping to put together a team with. And there's just a lot of like extracurricular things that I've been doing. So like there's not as much time to really think about like what you want to make and like the, the food and all that stuff. So she, but, she helps with that. But I always remind him that we have to make up our mind because otherwise we don't know what to buy for the week. And we don't like to go to the stores too often because it'll require us to leave our house. So we'll pick a designated day. Like this is the day that we're going out. These are all the things we're going to buy and that's it. We're going to make meals. She maps the meals with these ingredients. Yeah. And if there's like a one-off, okay, we could walk across the street to Safeway to get that one ingredient that we don't have. But for the most part, our pantry is stocked. Our freezer is very stocked. Um, People who come visit our home (laughs) will look at his like cereal a collection for example I like wonder, cereal, like, okay how big is your, your family size oh it's just the two of us yeah we go through all this food <laughs> but you're prepared that's what it is yeah we're prepared yeah I, and honestly like she she takes pictures of the stuff we buy i usually just buy things when they're on like a really good sale like so yeah maybe i get a bunch of cereal but when i bought the boxes they were like 50 cents a box so like wow. it's like, I just get stuff that's usually dirt cheap. Dorothy so. says the cereal collection. Okay, that huge. stop picking on that one. There's a lot of stuff we have, but yeah, <laughs> I mean it's like when we cook so often, we just keep a lot of raw ingredients around. Um, the fresh stuff is generally what we go weekly for. Um, I know some people go like daily or like every other day, just depending on what they want. We try not like just because I said like there's so much that we're involved in, including then like you know personal care, like working out and stuff like that, like. Mm-hmm. We just don't have time to constantly run out and get stuff. So that's why we do try to plan and make sure that we have like a plan of what we want to eat and cook and have. Um, and like she said, so on, on the rare occasion, we'll run back out. But yeah, we try. We try to keep everything in line. We're, we're decent planners, I would say. Decent. Yeah. Yeah. It's mostly just the perishables and produce that we have to go out and replenish. But everything else we, we pretty much have. Yeah. I think that it's so fascinating, the, this idea that you plan out. And then if you're featuring, you know, diving into different cuisines, it's, it's like something, it's like eating out, right? You can look yes. to the uniqueness of that day. Exactly. You know, like nights, the pizza night or tomorrow is going to be curry. It's that's so cool. Yeah, actually. And that's, that is the great way to look at it. It's so true because like that, and that's why, like, I never understood always the, the, the culture of like eating out. Like I said, when I started the combo, I was like, we, when I was, a, when I was back home, we ate out like maybe once, twice. And then when I was after college, when I had my own place, literally never ate out. I always just cooked for myself. Um, like super rare blue moonish. Like w- would I go eat out? Because I just preferred, like you said, I have so many choices that I can do myself and I know how I cook it and the taste that I want and the ingredients I use and like how healthy it is for you and stuff like that. I just, 
I don't know. I feel like when you go places, it's just a lot of oils and butters. It tends to be, especially like, unless you, it, it's just, I don't know, unless you like get certain things, it's just a lot of the way that it is. So I, I well, find it to be very heavy and salty a lot tasty. of times. They have to have their customers come back. So they're definitely going to put a lot of taste in it. And they know their customers don't see what they're doing in the kitchen. But yeah, we, we'll get stuff like we got fast food just yesterday even. And like I I make, we got a fried chicken at a fried chicken place just because we were short on time. And um I, I make it myself a lot of times and she just was eating it and she's like, it's too salty. Like she's getting, even she's getting used to it now where it's like, it's just, you just can taste things, especially when you eat out. Like it's just the salt level and a lot of things is super high. So yeah. 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 Heavy hands. <laughs> My last question. Now this, give, give it some thought. So we've talked about, you know, finding new ideas, the inspiration when you're eating out, recreating, um, sometimes you look at things that, oh, no, that's too hard. What is the one dish that you have yet to make, you know, from a, a, a specific culture that you think will be next on the list? That you're, you're kind of questioning the difficulty, but you're mm -hmm. feeling ready to try it. I don't know offhand. Why don't we go over what we have made already? <laughs> All of them? <laughs> no, because at, at least they'll help us play process of elimination uh latin food we're pretty good at like mexican cuisine um i studied abroad in chile so my chilean mom taught me a lot about um latin cuisine and the main ingredients that go uh, to that i know which Let's one see. i would pick Asian. You, can, you can go on i know which one i would pick but you can go um uh, italian I don't know. Well, I mean, it's, all right. So the ones that I've always been, and this has been true for a long time for me that I'm always afraid of messing up that I used to, I used to kind of make it before I met her. So I'm not going to, I'm going to count it, but not count it at the same time. Like it's kind of cheating, but like I never made it good. And so I've kind of refused to make it since then. Um, and I'm afraid to try it, even though when we go out to places and they have it, she'll, she knows what I would get. Um, it's a, it's Cajun Creole cooking. So it's either a gumbo or a shrimp etouffee. And she's, it's one of the things where I told her like, oh, I'd love to try cooking that with you when like we were first started dating, like something complex. And then I kind of like, I think I just mentioned it as like an impress point, but like I did my head, I'm like, yeah, we ain't making that. Like, <laughs> it was like, it's, I've made it before. And it was one of the things I was challenged to make in college. Um, it was one of the ones where I was like the knight and that that's what they wanted. And I just can't get whatever the seasoning, the length of cooking, or just the, the texture even of the shrimp and the seafood in it, like, um, I just can't get that one quite right. And then to the extension of that is like a chapino. Um, I'm afraid to, to do something like that, like a, another one where it's like a, lo a long-term type cooking with a lot of different things in there that require very specific times to cook. Um, those two, like Cajun Creole, um, like gumbos and stuff like that, or like they said, the shrimp etouffee and the chapino. And I know the one that we would say together that we wanted to do though, that you said that you, we want to do, a paella. Oh, yeah. Ooh, paella. Yeah. Yeah. But but Jess, I'm curious to know, do you know what a chipino is? I don't know. Oh. A lot of people don't know what chipino is. Really? Did you know what it is before coming to San Francisco? Yeah. Okay. Because um, I learned that it's a San Francisco thing. So in San Francisco, there's a famous spot called the Fisherman's Wharf. And a long time ago, there were a bunch, a bunch of fishermen who um, would spend their day fishing, and sometimes when they didn't catch the type of fish they wanted, or if they didn't have, uh, they they didn't catch enough fish, they would just walk around to other fishermen, and people would just dump things into their pot. Oh, I got mussels today. I got clams today. Oh, I got crab. And then um, yeah, I guess crabs. the people who originally <laughs> created chipino, they decided, well, now that I have all this fish and shellfish. Um, let's make it into a stew. And they added tomato sauce and tomato paste. And that's how Chipino came about. And that's why I was curious to know if you knew what it was, because most people who have not visited we, San Francisco or are not from here may not know. We had it up in, in Cleveland by Lake Erie. Oh. Um, and they had stuff there. So I don't know. We had it at like Italian restaurants. Oh. Yeah. I, yeah, it, it rings a bell in terms, I think it's it's never that name on the menu, but it might be something like a seafood stew or a fisherman yeah. stew or something like that. Yeah, like a fisherman stew, exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
But yeah, those are the those are the ones. I know you asked for one, but those are probably like the three different ones. Um, we're getting into the ones now where, like I said, the, the ones that take more complexity in terms of the the things that go in, getting them each done properly, getting your base done right, which is like just like the rice for sushi. You have to have the base right or everything else fails too. Um, and that's, like I said, because of the length of cooking and the amount of time and the amount of things you have to put in when, um, we just haven't dove into those three yet, but I would say that any of those three could be next up. So keep an eye out. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I will be watching and everyone else watching this video either now or in the future, I encourage you to also watch, um, on the lookout. So that leads me, Sarah and Andrew, this conversation has been absolutely wonderful. Um, it's so fun talking to the both of you. Wish we were closer geographically. Um, <laughs> I'd love to see the, the cereal collection in the kitchen and everything else. <laughs> but tell us, you know, um, as a reminder, where can we find what you do and follow along with all your delicious recipes and, and content? Sure. Right now, we are only on Instagram. That's our only platform. So it's at a couple of cooks. Um, I don't know. Should we expand to YouTube? <laughs> If you ever want to do the video editing for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're looking in, into YouTube in the future just so we can have longer length videos so that we can share more. I feel like Instagram is um, like, it, it, ever since they introduced Reels, for example, a lot of people's attention spans has reduced to 15 seconds. So if you cannot catch them within 15 seconds or deliver everything that you want to share, um, you might lose them. Thanks. So I feel like YouTube, Thanks, TikTok. yeah, I think that YouTube is the better platform for people who want to honestly share um, in-depth recipes and conversations with people. We, we do love watching YouTube videos just for food. We'll eat dinner and we'll sit and watch YouTube videos about the cooking and stuff. I have like favorite ones. Generally mine are like nature and like they're cooking out in the wild and it's like just silent, like the sounds of cooking and they'll just like kind of write what the thing is. And she likes these very like high production quality videos. I like the rusted ones, so. So to do a YouTube, you'll have to kind of find a happy medium there. Yeah, we'll find a happy medium there. Uh, believe me, if we ever get a place that has land, I'd love to do like an outdoor, like fire pit style cooking. That, like my um, my uncle, we used to like roast stuff over fires and stuff like that. So like, we, I, have a lot, I have a lot of stuff and passion like in the back of my head stored up for like the future future. But yeah, in the short term, that's, that's where you can find us. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I hope, you know, the rest of the weekend is, is wonderful for you guys. Um, we are- Halloween weekend. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Not, um, so much going on this time of year. So thank you so much for your time and, and best of luck to you as you continue on your foodie journey. Um, it's, it's always great to see the new things that you put out and to stay in touch. So thank you so much. Thank you, awesome. Jessica. Yeah, thank you. Thanks You're for having welcome. us. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.